Hello, friends and other folks of Zeldathon. You're all our friends. I'm kidding. Welcome <laughs> back to Book Club. It's 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 Trina, but it's not Mags. It's it's these other two lovely la wrong way lovely ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I got other M's. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, True. we got other M's to replace Mags. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for stepping in, guys. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do this all by myself. <laughs> I, I Mags is a Mags is a powerful force to replace. Um, so we needed two more M's to replace it, Mags. It, it really is. It really is. Yeah, um, well, I'm always happy to pick up a book. Yeah. It's been so, a while yeah. since I read, honestly. I need to do it more. It, that, I think that, that's, that's kind of one of the benefits of book club. Like, I know I, you know, even though I'm a librarian, like, I have this very long list of like, oh, that looks good. Oh, that looks good. But then, like, I have video games, too. Oh no, now what do? So, but yeah, it's the guys the end be like, I am contractually obligated to finish this by Saturday night. Ta -da. Oh god, I had like a whole I had a really crazy week until finally Thursday I was like, I need to start this book. And I think I read like I half of it Thursday, half of it yesterday. I and started I also... a bit of it before and then uh, I realized the way I like to read books now is I have a little stair stepper and I just did my stair stepper while reading oh, the book. Oh, there you go. This Ooh, is great. Yes. <laughs> I would yeah. probably do audiobooks with that, just because I'd be like, I'm, my hands are all sweaty, yeah. it's going to get to the book! Audiobooks helps with my ADHD. Like, if I'm only doing one thing, I can't. And you can't do, like, physical reading and another thing. That doesn't right. really work. Right. Especially uh, driving, which is where most of my come in. This, oh. is, this, <laughs> yeah. this is a bad idea, don't do it. It's, I used, it's I illegal. I used to get scolded by my parents for reading while I walked to school. Uh, hey, Orion, Ilya, and Eonorb. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad people are friending up. We will probably, we might be a little light at the start, I realized, because of daylight savings having happened earlier this week. And since the US does it earlier than a lot of other countries, there'll be sort of a weird disconnect for a couple weeks. And we're in that disconnect. So if folks show up late, we get it. <laughs> it's a weird time we of year. Forgive you. We, we, we forgive you, as long as you read the book. I'm okay. You can be here even if you didn't read the book. But the book! I guess before we even get into reading the book, we can remind everyone coming in that, hey, this time um, it's not oh, yes. just uh, but we're also fundraising for Stop AAPI Hate, which stands for Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. And yeah, just everything that has happened recently, the attacks in Atlanta, but just increased violence towards Asian Americans from the start of the pandemic now, which has been over a year ago oh my goodness we at zeldathon wanted to do our part and help out in ways that we could just to raise awareness or raise funds towards that cause yeah for sure yeah so yeah, we do charity here at zeldathon so so monica you had a little bit of incentive you were gonna do for that yeah want to tell the folks mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, so for every single $10 donation, I will start hat stacking. I have another pair of headphones that I'll slip on. So these don't get in the way. <laughs> and then, yeah, every $10, I will add another hat to my stack. Can I ask how many you have, like, available to use? Uh, how much do we have to pay to no, make you run out? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten right now. Ten hats. But if we go beyond that and I need to stack more, I can adjust the camera taller and go grab more hats from around. I just grabbed this many to start. All right. That, that, is, that is your challenge for today, chat. Make Monica go get more hats. It's okay, Ilya. <laughs> you know, from a, we always say you don't have to have finished the book or even tried to read the book to show up to book club. Um, we just, we're here to enjoy that li good literature exists and, and talk about kind of some of the stuff in it. Um, also, before we get started, reminder that prize jam, where we're trying to get lots of good prizes for next marathon's prize packs is a thing. If you do the art or the 3D printing, or if you just have like an extra game code for like Skyrim or something sitting around, talk to me and I will help get you get that to a to Liz mostly, but into a prize pack where people can win it, and then maybe someone will donate specifically because they're like, "Ah, that's a really cool thing. I wish I could win that thing." We'll be like, "Guess what? You can." So please do that. 
I, oh no, Ilya, don't tell me that. I was already afraid of that. Ilya says she thinks I'm going to be extremely disappointed in the movie when I watch it tomorrow. Oh, have you never what? seen it, Trina? I have never seen the movie, no. I oh, mean, wow. it was, because it was what, 2002, 2003? Yeah, it was early I, Anne Hathaway yeah. days. I did not watch it till I was older, I remember. I think, I want to say like 16 or 17 was when I watched okay. it. Okay. Yeah. At, at first, when you said, like, I think about doing El Enchanted, I was like, Oh, I love that movie. It's got Amy Adams, and, you know, she's animated, <laughs> but then she's not. But then I remembered that was Enchanted. Enchanted was a good movie. It is yeah, just that, not, not this that. book. <laughs> no. It, um, kind of, it kind of falls into, like, I mean, it, I don't know if you, would you really use the same phrase for for movies doing it, but it does kind of fall into that same, like, trend of, like, fairy tale adaptations, though. Like, that was one of the things I thought of while I was revisiting this, because this was, like, well ahead of the current trend, which has maybe more or less died out by now. But, like, you know, YA for a hot minute there, it was, like, every other book it felt like that came out was based on some fairy tale or another. Magical fantasy, like, type of thing. Right, but, or, like, even just, you know, very specifically, like, based on Cinderella, like this one, or based on Beauty and the Beast, or based on... I mean, I know the four that Lunar Chronicles were based on, but, um... Oh, yo! Hermione's raiding us! Thank you for the <gasps> raid! Hermione Hello. made book club and she brought friends! Hi, Hermione's friends! This is... Hi, Hermione Thank you! This is, this is Zeldathon Book Club. We're gonna talk about Ella Enchanted this week, and you're just in time for us to get into the actual discussion portion of it. Hermione is a very loyal attendee of our book club, and... Honestly, we're probably going to have to have you guest at some point, Ms. Hermione. But <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. But yeah, um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know that I could name very many of the adaptations off the top of my head. But definitely, the Lunar Chronicles was one of the more popular um, fairy tale adapted novels. Um, it's Cinderella, except it takes place in China, and also Cinderella is a cyborg in a society where cyborgs are second class citizens. It's, huh. it's really good. Really um, this, was this around the time when the game Fable came out as well? Because I know Fable was an adaptation possibly, of a bunch I, of fairy tales. Kind of a dark. I would have to look it though. up at this point. It was in like the last like ten years, definitely. Maybe closer to five years ago. But oh, <laughs> Ilya's getting us a list. Let's go, oh, man. I also know I don't know that it really ended up feeling like one, but I know that the um Throne of Glass series, which I only know about because my old roommate read it back when it was a like draft on um not fan fiction, but it's fiction press. It's like non fan fiction counterpart. Um, which is like, what if Cinderella was an assassin sent to kill the prince? And it very much is not that when it actually got published, but still, mm. it sort of started off with that, that was neat. original thing. But yeah, it's just, I find it interesting that, it almost feels like fan fiction, to be honest. Like, it's mm. the same sort of appeal in fan fiction, I think, where you're like, here's this, here's stuff that is already familiar to your readers and listeners, and it's, it's the what you do differently that's really going to catch their attention rather than like, having to right. set the groundwork for like this is this person this is their mm -hmm. life story this is and then you're like oh but what if we change this or i don't like this ending let's do this instead mm -hmm. so there are definitely some very interesting aspects to like the world building in this book that i thought I was like interesting kind of, <laughs> different kind of additions on like different fairy tale things like you know like um I want to say, like, oh, ogres are just, like, very persuasive or whatever. Like, that's just their skill. It's, like, that's just, like, a neat little detail to add in. Yeah, like, like you, know, you know. You're familiar with ogres. You can picture it. But normally, like, you, you would think that, you know, strength or constitution is the ogre's highest stat, not uh, charisma. Persuasion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do a persuasion roll. Persuasion check. <laughs> They win so many persuasion checks in this book. <laughs> there, there is one that kind of creeped. Like, there was one that I found very interesting, which was the fact that like centaurs aren't sentient. I had yeah. a very difficult time imagining that because I'm like imagining like I don't know like you know centaurs. a human face. Yeah, <laughs> right, like, like the Harry Potter so ones, like yeah. in just like showing their like, why are you putting me in a zoo? What's wrong with you? Rather than right. like 
Hor- like trying to superimpose a horse, an actual horse's like expression onto a human face. And that's right. just like, I mean, I get like they are part horse. Like nothing yeah. says they have to have the human half of the intellect rather than the horse half of the intellect. But no, I just, there's a lot of little, it, it, it is a very rich world building for like compared to other books in, you know, sort of the upper grades stuff. Like when I, for as much of like the higher level, you know, intended for adult f- fantasy that I read, I'm like, oh, but they could be doing this and this and this. I'm like, okay, it's for like, it was written for, to a target audience of like 10, 11 year olds. Calm down, Trina. But, <laughs> which doesn't mean it's not good. Um, but yeah, so had either, or okay, so maybe you said you had seen the movie. Uh, Monica, mm-hmm. had you seen the movie? I have once very long ago, like I remembered immediately that it's Anne Hathaway in the movie. Right. And then like I was considering rewatching it, but then I specifically didn't because they're going to watch it tomorrow. But even though now I'm not sure I'll be able to watch the movie with everyone Uh, tomorrow. I have a pretty good recollection of like most of the plot of the movie and some and some notable differences I, I might bring up. I, I know we are gonna watch it. <laughs> all that I remember in the movie is her green dress, which hey, they did mention in the book too. Oh. I'm like, yo, let's go. Your girl yeah. remembers an outfit. <laughs> um, yeah, there's definitely a solid amount of difference in the plot. I'm guessing. Yeah. I'm guessing there's a tonal difference. Is what my because yeah. like because you can change like what the dress looks like or what the actual character even looks like and still have a really good movie. But I feel like the tone and just, like, the examination of, like, power and consent and, like, those deep, complex issues are what made this a good book. Or where I've yeah. got it, it's the it's Newberry Honor. And based on the, like, preview, I think that's why I didn't see the movie. Because, like, based on the previews, I'm like, this looks like, like, there are lighthearted move- moments in the book. It looks like they just stretched it over the entirety of the movie and yeah. just, like, turned it into a comedy. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not... So it has uh, the vibe of a Shrek, honestly. Musical. <laughs> a jukebox huh. musical. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, that is, I mean, there's a really, there's a big scene where she sings, like, a queen song. In, oh, like, that's, what, okay. Tower. I'm like, what does jukebox musical mean? Does that just mean, like, pre-existing songs, not, like, Pretty much, they yeah. wrote it? I mean, yeah. I guess there is the singing component. Like, we do see a number of songs come up in the book, and they talk about how the air, every, I forget the name of it. Don't ask me how to pronounce things in books. I'll always be they wrong. They talk <laughs> about how music is so strong there, but then they also talk about how it's not, like, hamming it up music, whereas a musical usually is. Right, so. it was just this, like, really deep, like, I don't want to say feely, because that's not a word, but you know what I mean. Emotional. <laughs> I know words. I'm a librarian. Um, emotional like deep like emotional music those yeah people, which is really cute like i like the one song about like something together that one is really nice i thought well i think it's interesting that like you know we know from char's letters that like they hardly talk at all and so like you take all the feelings and emotions and stuff that like you know maybe normally you would express in spoken language and it sounds like all of it is basically bottled into these songs which i feel like would make the songs just like extra potent like it's like oh that's what you've been feeling for the last like several months oh oh all at once oh wow okay i thought it was i liked really liked how the book acted it was kind of like it felt like a way to add in like a half omniscient narrator but oh, like, the magical book, yes. Yeah, the magical book. Mm-hmm. Also, you're going to be disappointed by the book in the movie. <sighs> oh, no. It's, it's, it is a... It is just like a guy's face in a book that can also show her other things, oh. but it's a comic relief character. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. So, uh, he, like, obnoxiously the book reads the letters in a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> God, I wish. I don't remember who the, who the person voicing the book was, but... Yeah, it's definitely very tonally different. Yeah, no, that's kind of which, because it was it was Disney, right? I I'm pretty sure I, it's on Disney Plus, so I'm strongly leaning towards. I I, I feel like that's that's a theme for them because we talked like- we talked about that a little bit with Holes, where like it was a li- like not quite as dissonant with Holes probably as it will be in this one, but like Holes, we're like here's this you know. T- commentary on like the prison system basically and like abusing kids and just 
there was just like a layer stripped away for the Disney stuff. It was just well, like, was actually, well, this sucks, but haha, we're still having a good fun time here. It actually was not Disney, turns out. It was some oh. film place called Miramax Films. Oh, I was starting to huh. it. Interesting. I would still consider it a Disney like treatment, it. though. They probably <laughs> picked it, yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, so, Ella's Curse. Yes. Uh, Ella's Ella's gift. You oh, yeah. I, I think <laughs> Lucinda. <laughs> Lucinda would uh, come and give you some talking to about that. Yeah, she has to find me first. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really interesting, though. Like, that's how it starts, is it just throws you right into it, and it tells you about the gift. And it, it tells you about it really nicely through introducing Lucinda and how it's not malintent, but then she's just such a stubborn character that it sets you up and you see how Ella's stuck with it. Right, yeah, no, the yeah. fact that there are good intentions at play absolutely does not mean that there aren't horrific consequences for what she does. Oh, for sure. Which is probably a lesson for all of us. It, um, <laughs> it was definitely interesting how it was introduced, too, because I think, like, you know, it just opens with the curse, and then the first thing she, like, gives the example of is on her birthday when her like mother at basically accidentally is like said like now eat and then she literally couldn't stop eating the cake like a like that yeah cake. no like that's it, it just you know the, that was probably the first time it occurred to like yeah. her mother or mandy either just like mm -hmm. i mean you know it's there, the, there's the obvious level of it which is the like you know go jump in a lake or mm -hmm. the dangerous oh, think, ones but then yeah. just the fact that like accidental stuff can happen right. to you, which is what, what honestly i feel like at least half of this book is of the stuff that happens in the is. book is i mean like not so much with like hattie but but right. most of the people she runs into it's accidental and it's just like she yeah. can't have a ton of bossy people in her life which is fortunate for her yes i was thinking just like oh my gosh can you imagine like if she because it sounds like written stuff can work too and like, yes, can you imagine if like she lit? Can you imagine trying to combine that curse with like being on the internet? Oh my god! Oh, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't last a day. Uh, like, oh, even if you no. don't get to like people doing death threats, like, just there. Anyway, like, go eat Tide Pods and then. Oh eat. gosh! <laughs> yes. <laughs> If someone tells you to get dunked on, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> they put under a basketball hoop on. and just wait for someone to do a slam dunk on. Uh, yeah, no, there's there's one particular moment that I don't know if we'll talk about that till later, though, because that was like a big moment where there was like a specific. I'll talk about it now because I brought it up. There's like. It was early on in the book, too, though. I think so, yeah. I want to say it was the part where. Um, Lucinda, where she tries to get Luc find Lucinda for the first time, and she goes to Lucinda pretending to be someone else, and Lucinda says like, "Oh, don't be sad about like my don't be sad about your obedience. Be happy about it." And then there's about like a chapter and a half where like you get her internal monologue of her being like obsessively obedient, and then it's, it's like only more. Once that's more terrifying than it, if someone did tell her to go kill herself. It like was viscerally psychologically, honestly, like it was that I, was like one of the hardest to read parts. It I was, thought. and then when Mandy like finally like realizes and frees her from it, and just like the amount of emotional distress she has on her from like realizing that state she was in was just yeah, it was hard it's to like read. She cried for like the entire night, and like just I would yeah. too. <laughs> like yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely there's definitely worse like pretty awful things that people can do with that. Yeah, but I, I guess the interesting oh. part of the book that I didn't really think about though until now and us talking about it because the, the instance that you first mentioned uh, or the instance like when you brought it up, I thought it, you would mention when she first introduced the ogres and how mm. the ogres were saying like hand over the child, like come here. And it's interesting because everyone can kind of experience that having to do something that they don't want to do when they run into the ogres in this book which i never really considered or thought of before and like the ogres are one of the main horrible villains so like it seems horrible having to do something like that and still lucinda doesn't consider that when she's thinking of uh, ella's gift right 
And there's a lot. There's a lot of strange. Like uh, I think because Lucinda also gives a gift to um, her father when he gets married, if I recall. And I remember. I, I don't have like the exact quote. Um, but it was something like he was like, oh, I like gift you with like eternal love. You you yeah. will love each other forever. And I think the line was like Sir Peter like had a face of like open mouthed horror before like that came over him. And it's just so like I think that's the worst ones for me. It's not even being forced to do things against your will. It's to have it's the mind your, manipulation. It's to have your will like completely taken away from you. Right, yeah. because with the exception, that's what like makes Ella's character really like really interesting is with the exception of that like chapter and a half it's like she she finds weight she's a rebel like despite having to obey she is a rebel at heart with like her you know finding the way to the smallest way to obey or finding like loopholes basically and just like she still has that level of freedom for the most part and like, it would just be such an uninteresting book if it was just not completely uninteresting. It'd be less interesting if it was, and then I had to do this, and I did it, and then I had to do this, and I did it. And it would yeah. just be, like, it'd just be a cause and effect. It'd be, like, this isn't a character anymore. Right. Like, the finishing school scene would have been boring completely had she not had that aspect because just hearing the music teacher having to coach her like various times to like notch by notch well, what's the funny right was, or the volume yes i will say it was funny how like with the when at the beginning when she was actually trying to hit the note that wasn't on purpose that was just like bad. her was bad, bad singing <laughs> like being shoved into shape by the curse just like yeah. how the curse interacts with like things she's not actually technically able to do yeah <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the the descriptions like that they gave of Ella like each time like she got a curse like they gave very intense like physical descriptions like you know she would like you know hold her hands against her legs and like kind of like do her best to fight it and I thought that was very that like I don't know I felt like it fleshed it out a little bit more that she could still have some amount of resistance mm -hmm. right and then it's interesting how quickly Hattie picked up on that too and like when Hattie was saying to her mom she's like look you can see she's trying to fight it but she's gonna have to like look at how red her face is getting yeah it's interesting that Hattie is the only one in the whole like I think Hattie and Olive to some extent I think all like there's a letter at some point where I think Olive doesn't realize it's like a curse but like it's interesting that Hattie is like the only one to pick up on it yeah right well it's, I think Hattie's such a bossy character right like I thinks like Hattie was just like possessive enough of her power over Ella that at finishing school at least like it sounded like she was kind of like intentionally trying to like I mean obviously she was like secret in a way when she was giving her own orders but I almost wonder if like when other like kids would have like accidentally given her orders it was just like oh no you want to do this instead or something like if she we don't have text for that, but if, I can I can picture it. To use it on other students, I can picture like, it. <laughs> or no, like I, I can picture like if someone else was getting close to discovering to figuring Ellis. out Ella's that Hattie would have found a way to be like, oh no, get them no, away from her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I suppose it's, it's interesting. It's sort of like you know, a, a, a manipulative and mean person is naturally drawn to that sort of like you know power dynamic that can be abused. Right, yeah, no, they absolutely go after those who can't fight back, and she is literally the picture of, for the most, like, of those who can't fight back, like, one way or the other. Why didn't she use the persuasion more after she figured that aspect out? Oh, oh there was the... <laughs> where, okay, hold on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I, you know, I I imagine Hattie is a decently smart person. Like, it, it, it seems like I think she would know, like, if she used it too much, people would notice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And plus, Ella did, like, all she could to avoid everyone. Like, I think that she mentioned, like, she hid in the library and... Yeah, you know. and, like, that's why she didn't have friends, really, aside from her mom and Mandy. And, like, that's why it was so traumatizing and traumatic when her mom first died. Because, like, those were the two people who knew about the curse, too. So then, like... It was right when she was not a little kid anymore, so it was kind of at a slightly better time. But then, yeah, I guess that was really interesting at finishing school is where she made her first friend, who obviously was not Hattie, but um, the other girl, Aria. Areta. Areta. Yeah. Areta. Yeah, that was, I, I liked Areta's character very much, and I'll 
I like how she interacted, like, kind of, because it was, like, her friendship with Areta that drove forward the plot, you know? Yeah, it was, right. It was the fact that she got ordered to not be friends with Areta, and she, That's like... so rude. And, and so couldn't deal with, like, having to hurt someone she loved that she would rather, like... Just run. Just run dip. away. Right. Like, yeah. I kind like, she honestly might have run away even without the, oh, hey, Lizzie is going to be in this place. I could go find her, like... Mm-hmm. Just... Yeah. I think it but was I... a good way to get around stop being friends with her too because like she never truly did have to stop being friends with her so like you said she would always think of ways to get around the curse right for sure it's her stubbornness and i think like that whole chapter after she gets ordered is mostly her kind of like internal dialogue of trying to figure out she's like i could say i've taken a vow of silence oh but no then she would still find ways to. <laughs> but she's too good me. of a person yeah <laughs> <laughs> she'll be too nice and then i love that it was Areta who came up later again in the book as kind of like the final piece to the puzzle and making things work too. This it just speaks volumes to her character and how nice and how good Areta is seeing the good in people too. Yeah. Like I think like uh, you know the one of the parts where she's reading Char's letters later and and like Char's talking about like oh I've met this strange woman in like you know the or no it was Areta's letters uh, diary sorry yeah and where Char like comes yeah I, I ran to Char and like I kept defending defending Ella even though I was contradicting the prince but like yeah right she just felt those so strongly about it she's like I know this girl she wouldn't like yeah I I do wonder if like Ella had stuck around how long it would have taken for her to like convince Arita that they weren't that she was like done being her friend or if like it would have been just like this is so out of character for you i'm not buying it like what's wrong with mm -hmm. you what's happening yeah. or if it just would have been like i can't i can't <laughs> she's a good one yeah for sure yes phil lucinda just Oh, and she doubled down. Yeah, we were talking <laughs> oh, about that. Because, like, that's yeah. what we were saying was the most difficult to read part of the book was when you know Ella doesn't want to do what she's doing. And it, especially in that instance, when her dad is doing something so traumatic and trying to marry her off to an old man, and she's like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And, you know, absolutely. Like, she's in love with someone else. She would not want to be And she's, like, off. what, 15, 16? 15, yeah. Yeah. At the beginning uh, of the book, anyway. It's gross. Uh, that no. was, yeah. I the <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. No. Um, yeah, that was definitely the most upsetting part to read. Yeah. And it's very, it's very telling, I think, that, you know, Lucinda changes her mind after she gets she, to walk a mile yeah, in their suits. Like, and I think specifically Lucinda does say she got one of those orders about, like, you know, having, uh, like, of being unable to control her thoughts. Like, I think she was, like, a you know she transformed herself into a young right girl it was like some sort of moral like, something keep those on keep those morals on your mind and she like literally couldn't stop thinking about something so right yeah and she she gave herself a pretty vanilla version too of experiencing the curse like she went as a young girl with a fit like a loving family and she's still like oh i couldn't handle it right like you only had it for three months bro <laughs> bro exactly imagine ella which, like, which I feel like makes an interesting discussion point out of, like, was Lucinda's decision to then, after that, not remove the curse because it was big magic? Yeah, Yay? That, oh, like, that that's... Me a bit. <laughs> out of characters I want to punch in the face, so it was probably up there. I would yeah. say even, where even where is she compared to Hattie? <laughs> yeah, even some more than Hattie, though, because, like, Lucinda, like... Come on, like, come on. Right, like, Hattie has to, like, know at some level that she's not a great person, but she doesn't care, whereas Lucinda is like, I, everyone loves me, everyone, I do all the good yeah. things. Despite people literally telling her the opposite. Oh, and, no, like, when she went to that other wedding, and she's like, you two can never leave each other's side, and they're, like, literally sobbing. Uh, she's like, oh, look yeah. at how happy Yeah, they no, are. I, Nailed both, it. both me yes. and Retsum are introverts, and, like, we definitely need, like, our evening Your a week, space. where we do our own yeah. thing, and it's just like, oh. And it's even, like, it's, I don't know, it's still, she still bugs me after, because she definitely learns her lesson about the bad, about, you know, how her gifts are bad and reckless, 
But I still feel like just like reversing the curse, like it's just, I don't know. I guess we don't know the full, we're supposed to buy into the lore that like big magic is like bad in all circumstances. Maybe she's just so dumb she doesn't know how to. Recover. <laughs> <laughs> like that's Honestly. why she never took anyone's gift away and she never, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> to cover. Oh my goodness. But yeah, in inaction is not necessarily helpful at times. Um, Mm-hmm. But I do like I feel like Lavina's so good at like st- weaving at like structuring her stories. Like mm-hmm. you know, we have like it a really good so well. setup. It does. Like we have so early on, like okay, Ella has some fairy blood in her which means she has small feet. And right away you're like, oh, oh, that's why it's going to be only her feet that the shoes can fit at the end. And then you have, like, I like how there's, like, two fairies working to form the, like, fairy godmother of the original Cinderella. So it's Mm -hmm. just, like, these are, like, two different levels of, there's, okay. Yeah. You gave her a nice dress versus, like, you turned... You, you made people. <laughs> it's like, what if Cinderella had two fairy godmothers and the second one was just terrible? <laughs> Honestly. The it, I felt like such an idiot. I did not clue into it being Cinderella until it was the balls and they were talking about until like, the pumpkin the carriages. carriage. I felt like such a fool. I'm like, wow. <laughs> you ever have a humbling experience? <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I've done that with stuff. I'm like, oh, that's uh, okay. Yeah, I should have seen that a few months ago. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ilya. We'll have to look through that for fairy tale retellings. I actually kind of want to open it now and let you know which ones I recognize. <laughs> I, I'm sure Cinder is is on the top. Um, yeah. I don't think I've I don't think I I've read a lot it. of this genre just because I I tend to lean more towards like sci-fi mm. and like more like few because there are aspects of fantasy in like science fiction and those sort of things. Oh yeah, but, no, they're know, definitely not, related genres. It's it's not that you know I yeah. For me, your girl reads a lot of horror, a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I also I also tend to like a lot of like weird. What have you ever read? Um, the city and the city, Trina. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It is this really weird fictional fiction book about like two cities that physically occupy the same space at the same time, mm. but like it's it's very bizarre mm. and it's like people have to like pretend they can't see the other city while they're in one of these cities. Phil it's is. Bizarre. A, I think I think that's what Phil just hecky had. I hope so. It's an amazing <laughs> book. Anyway. Oh, and House of Leaves. It's that genre that I love mm. so much. Oh, I, I have been intending to read House of Leaves for like a decade and a half. Yeah. It sounds anyway, super brief weird. derailment. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have not actually read as many of these as I... Oh, right. Duh. Just Ella. Which, obviously, I another... I do have the other two because the, that was, the, it was only available in a trilogy on Barnes & Noble. So. Oh, that's not... Yes, the... Okay, I do... I don't think that Two Princes in, of um, Balmer is based on any particular thing. I think I actually liked that better than Ella Enchanted growing up. And I think it was just because the main character of that book is, like, a very shy and reserved girl. And I related to that more than, like, I enjoyed reading Ella's Wit, but I was not a witty child. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> um, but no, Just Ella um, is by Margaret Peterson Haddix. Um, who did the Shadow Children, like, series, if any of y'all read that, Among the Hidden. Um, it's familiar. Yeah, that one, like, starts, like, at the end of Vanilla Cinderella, and <laughs> is just, yeah, I know. Um, but then it's just, like, realizing, like, oh, the prince kind of just married her because, like, she was pretty, and that's, like, and for political reasons, basically, and that's not, like, a good basis for relationship and she basically ends up feeling like she's based just like a prisoner in the palace um i'm winning now oh thanks Aww. i i will credit some of that to retsum at least the man has Aww. a gift for snark and it has to rub off to me sooner or later uh, um, I, I was raised with snark so i'm just full of it <laughs> um yeah i'm actually not recognizing a ton of other books on Ilya's list but i am sure they are all pretty good um Yes, where were we? <laughs> um, we've just been kind of bouncing around the book, so... We have, rather. Mm. Can we talk right. about how wonderful Mandy is? 
We all yeah. need a man. Mandy is like the Iro of this book. Let's be honest. Oh like, my goodness, yeah. she is oh, totally yeah. like the Iro. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. And then it's nice too because like she just, especially after uh, Ella's mom died, she made it her mission just to look out for Ella and make sure she's looked after and she's got someone in her corner. Oh goodness, it's about to be cat time. <gasps> cat time. <laughs> Here he is. Oh, cat time. We'll get a nice, Hi, buddy. A, a nice, a nice, uh, sun, uh, sun flare. Yeah. Um, get the cat. We got the J.J. Abrams <laughs> solar lens flare. Yes. I think the sun's going down where I live. So. Yeah, it is sunbeam o'clock right now here, but hopefully that'll be over soon, and then I can move my head back to the center. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Mandy, yeah. and like, just her character as well, I love that even when Ella went to finishing school, Mandy was still a character who we heard from, and yeah, just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, she's still looking after Ella. Like, you know, she knows she can't really intervene with a lot of Sir Peter's going-ons and things, but she can still keep an eye on Ella and care for her, which is very nice. It's a very, She's very nice. She is. And she's very, like, deliberate about how she uses her magic. Mm -hmm. Like, she, you know, mm -hmm. small magic. And, small like, magic. you know, I'm sure, like, after like centuries of experience she just has kind of a better feel for what would be considered small magic but i can see her as like a younger fairy or whatever like sort of thinking as she's like you know about to do something she's like what's the worst that could happen okay that's not that bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah that seems like pro that's probably a good a good way to think about magic is like okay what's the worst butterfly effect we could get <laughs> if you can think of the a very bad thing don't do it honestly <laughs> That, I mean, that now that should not be applied to normal decisions because I don't, that's, oh, okay. anxiety, that's called anxiety. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> do, do, yeah, no. Um, yeah. But I mean, like, maybe it should be applied to situations in which we ourselves hold like a lot of power. Mm. Like, mm. power should be wielded very deliberately with like a mind for what possible consequences should be. Um, I was going to flesh this out more, but... <laughs> yeah, That's no. something that clicked to me at the end of the book was the importance of decisions, not, on like not only the importance of making decisions, but also the ability of having decisions and kind of that privilege of being someone who's able to do that and you have that joy in life. Yeah. Like, I mean, I can't really think of any other characters that kind of paralleled Ella in terms of, like, not having levels of control and not being able to like me i mean i suppose areta had a little bit of that um but yeah there's definitely ways other than a magical curse that people can you know be trapped in a situation where they can't make decisions right. but do you love the parallel too that it was ella who figured out how to speak ogres or mm -hmm. ogres whatever and then in turn realized that she can turn the ogres abilities on them and then she kind of had that experience of being able to tell someone hey do this and seeing that come to fruition but then it also got her completely out of the well not completely out of the situation with the ogres i mean we have prince char and right. um uh -huh. the soldiers to thank for that but that was super cool but no Everybody she did she did the bulk yeah. of the work there and even they oh. admit that <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> is this the part where we talk about char and about what wonderful person he is oh my god and i love how he was introduced right as kind of like a little beam of sunshine through the clouds after her mom died and it was at the funeral that she truly got to know him and like that from talking to him was the first instance that she smiled and was able to just not be crying and sobbing right. and in complete pain from her mother dying yeah I yeah. think, like, you know, her her father wasn't comforting at all. Mandy could provide comfort, but Mandy had also lost Eleanor. So that was probably also hard for her. And then to have Prince Char come in and be just, like, you know, a kind of gentle figure to tell her, mm. like, everything's going to work out. It'll be okay. So And I, I love that it wasn't an immediate romance for her, too. Like, she just saw him as a friend, and she was so thankful to have a friend in that moment. So, yeah, maybe it wasn't um, Arianne who was truly... El Ella's first friend, but it was kind of Shire who was her first friend as a peer. For sure. I don't think she really saw it that way at first. I think she was like, oh, the prince is talking to me. Like, neat. 
but mm -hmm. like you know and then like they definitely develop their friendship more as like time goes on because i think she was writing some letters to him at finishing school i believe but then she like runs away and just happens to run into him again and then they get back to talking more and those sorts of things so right. yeah they're so they like, introduced but developed later yeah, and I, then I love, too, how it was Sir Stephen who said, Shari likes you so much because you're someone who talks to him on a real and human level. Like, you treat him like a person. You don't treat him like, I don't know. Like a prince. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess so much she does treat him like a prince, but, like, she can actually talk to him. And that's why he liked talking and being with her so much. Right. And, like, you can tell he had, like, a desire for that because, like, he, you know... He intentionally tells her the worst of himself is like one of the things that he mentioned is like he wanted her, her to know like all of him like even the, yeah. the crappy stuff and like because who are you gonna if you're a prince you have the reputation to uphold but like even on a normal level like you know mm -hmm. we have the parts of ourselves that we don't like but like we also want someone to know so that we know like we are still like lovable in that state like you know this yeah. about me but you're still sticking around like mm -hmm. i don't have to be afraid that everyone i know is going to run away if they find out this thing about me i loved her reply when uh he told her his flaw too about kind of being like unforgiving his grudges yeah yeah but uh, then her response was um not only i think i just see it as the way that you have an unparalleled way of looking out for people you love but also her follow-up with uh you'll get to know my flaws one day and you'll have to decide for yourself i was like Ooh, yeah. girl let's go <laughs> i mean she couldn't tell him to be fair she's, but like she's being cryptic in the dms <laughs> <laughs> what's your man doing <laughs> no and then like you know and i, I think he, you know char has a lot of themes of like wanting to kind of just have a normal companion and like you know i think that's where a lot of the like you know uh I don't want to say child, uh, like, you know, childishness, but sort of like, you know, um, kind of like energetic spirit and like wanting to just kind of like play around. And, you know, they ride down the stairs at the balls and, or not the ball, at the, um, the railing. Or, yeah, down the railing. Yeah. It's very good. Where, where are then, the railings I can slide down? <laughs> they don't make them anymore. <laughs> oh, I, I would slide, I, I would ride down the ban the railing at my parents house when i was a kid Damn. they would they didn't like it we <laughs> had an bottom. enclosed staircase you couldn't really do that oh <laughs> uh, gotcha yeah uh yeah, yeah for mine you'd have to start halfway but then also like i absolutely i love 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 the way the curse was broken in this book it was so sweet and so wonderful and you're gonna be very disappointed by the movie oh. uh no <laughs> no <laughs> because no. it's not that <sighs> um but in a no, book that's entirely about her agency it has to be done by her agency do they not I understand know. how themes work <laughs> i know it's but like it's just so sweet the way that it's like how just how much she cares for him yeah is the way she is the way she breaks the curse by like this is a decision she feels so strongly that she needs to make that that's what breaks it and it's interesting too how she goes about the other instances where she was trying to resist the curse but they didn't have that same drive like when it was her and the little gnome boy like it was she was trying desperately to resist but there was still other people there to help her and when she was trying with the ogres like she was able to resist just for a bit but like she still was giving in and like i think that one spoke volumes because the fact that the ogres also have the power of persuasion in them and then everything that she was trying to resist with Hattie, but it was all superficial. Like it wasn't life and death or someone that she loved that strongly. Yeah, but I think, you know, it's definitely interesting that it didn't work, that like, you know, it wasn't the ogres that broke that, which I think is sort of like a testament to like her wit and her determination. Like she's able to get out of the, from the ogres because she's smart and like, you know, she knows how to adapt to situations and deal with things. And I think it was... It, it was one love, but also the fact that I don't think she really had any other way out of the situation with Char other than to regain her agency and to refuse the marriage. Mm -hmm. So. And I think, I mean, I think, you know, most of us are not put into life and death situations, but I think it rings true for a lot of us that, like, we will push ourselves p 
past our limits more for other people than we will for ourselves. Yeah. Like, I, I'm specifically thinking of, like, a Tumblr post or something that's, like, you know, I have social anxiety and, like, you know, hate talking to, like, service people are on the phone. But if my friend is like, oh, I, they got my meal wrong, but I don't want to bother them, then I will turn into, like, full, oh. like, excuse <laughs> yeah, me. Like all the, everyone in the friend group has anxiety, and it's like, I'll, I'll order the pizza. I'll do it. <laughs> it's, it was my superpower. I was the one at Con Bravo who would call and make reservations. It was my power plan. Yeah. Like, I love talking to people. Same, that's my superpower. In my well, but, like, group. even if it's not your superpower, like, you, you are more likely to, like, push and come fast if it's just, like... Right. You're like, well, I don't want to make this person do it even more than I don't want to do it myself, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what comes into play is most instances, if you're a good person and a lot of people reading the book aren't Hatties, it's like, that's what you see. You're able to see that you'll rise up to do something for someone that you care about because you just don't want them to be going through pain and suffering. Like That's like one of the biggest motivations. That's why I like always... In movies, they never, like, threaten the character. They always, like, threaten the loved ones of the right. character. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah, always such sure. a dark move. Um, but, yeah, no, like, just, like, empathy is definitely, like, one of the themes of this book. Not just, yeah. you know, obviously Ella, we know, is a very empathetic character. But, like, okay, I love that, like, Char, obviously, is, like, super empathetic and, like, his parents are, too, apparently. Like, it's, I don't know, I feel like normally... In the one scene we see them in, they're very, they're very friendly. Right, well, and he, Char mentions, um, I don't remember if it was, like, in a letter, or, you know, I think it was in one of his letters to Ella, um, talking about, like, the moments where he knew what it would be to be a king, where he mentioned walking with his dad, and, like, someone threw a tomato, tomato. at him. And yeah. the king, like, stopped and, like, talked with him and, like, found out what was up with him, rather than, like, you know... Mm -hmm. That, that man assaulted the king, arrest him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like we don't see that a lot in, like, you know, books with monarchy settings. Like, if the right. if the prince love interest is, like, good, it's, he often will have, like, an evil dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it was interesting, too, because Ella very clearly only had one empathetic parent, and her dad kind of just sucked. Her dad just but, sucked, uh, yes. It, <laughs> see, like, her different perspectives of that, too, and, like, I, I don't know. And, like, I think because Shar had two empathetic parents, that's why she was able to learn from Shar as well and then just see his maturity. And he's like, wow, being the king sounds like it's going to be a thankless job. And his dad is like, bro, it is. <laughs> but yeah. It's your responsibility. Yeah, and he's like, I think he says something like, you know, I realized he, later he was laughing because getting hit by a tomato was, was, wasn't by, right. was by no means the worst. Bro, thing. this is nothing. <laughs> When when you right. work in customer service and your friends is like you know waiting for you to get off and they see someone get slightly heated over you won't take their coupon and you're like, dude, you didn't even see the person who threw like their entire order me last week. God. <laughs> My God. <laughs> yeah. I but I think it like it's fantastic uh, a book for like laying out lessons like that and making young readers think about that in those ways and just playing it out on the line but still making it really interesting and relatable and then looking for the fun in it too for sure yeah no it's definitely there, there's so many good the themes i think that are like wonderful for younger people like you know you have, you have the themes of empathy you've got themes of like you know power dynamics and how those can kind of like interact which is which is a kind of heavy topic for a for a kid's book but they mm -hmm. do it in a really lighthearted way that i think is super wonderful honestly yeah no i it's it's why this book has stood the test of time i think just it's not it, the ones that hold substance are the ones that you know people keep coming back to decades later like i'm sure mm -hmm. i read some fluffy like fun adventure books when i was little that like i can't even tell you the name of now because it was just it was just yay fun <laughs> and then done like yeah. you're just like oh this taught me something yeah, it was sneaky about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but like the tell, like it, it, it has such like, it's mostly negative things happening in the book, but it still manages to keep such a light tone. It's it's amazing. It's the banter. Yeah. It's, she's oh, the banter. Gosh. The banter is all of it. She's so much fun. I think 
the biggest thing about the book is trying to make the best of a crappy situation. I think that's truly like the overarching theme because like looking at what she has going on in her life and like all the stuff that's tossed at her, she's still always able to make the best of it and not ever give up completely and just, mm -hmm. yeah, she keeps going. And I think that's why it's such a good book. And like, that is a lesson that it teaches a lot of people is, hey, you're going to get knocks, but you got to keep going. Mm -hmm. and uh, and as we mentioned earlier like you know she takes as much agency as she can like when they say like ella come closer and she like takes a single One step. step yeah <laughs> wasting all of her time looking at you goosebumps true oh goosebumps i read i did I was not read kid. I... It, was, it was because my cousin like when he like graduated high school he was like moving out and gave me a box of like i want to say 50 goosebumps books goosebumps was, was like, my gateway into horror eight. And I was just like, okay. I think like, Animorphs might have technically been my entry like, into horror. Think about, like, <laughs> the horror of war! <laughs> Son of Goosebumps was so stupid. It was so fun. Like, yeah. the one where it's like, if you take a photo of someone, they die with this, like, like camera. So or, like, the one where there's, like, weird, like, their dad turns into a plant person or something. I also none, had of, none of those won Newberry Medals of Honor. Let's go, Ella Enchanted. <laughs> I, I also had one choose your own adventure Goosebumps book and oh man, that was wild. It was like flip to page four if you go through the left door, to page twenty eight if you. There you go. I mean, those those were fun. I think because they gave kids they feel like a sense of uh, agency. It's just like oh, I have control. I can, I get to make yeah. choices. Choices are fun. I like choices. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was just laughing at Phil's comment of Monica. There's an article about when R.L. Stein met Stephen King and told him, a lot of people say, I'm like you if you wrote for kids. And King just did. <laughs> oh my god. Thank you. I would too if I was Stephen King. It's like, we are not the same. <laughs> Don't talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's the thing. Like, I liked reading Goosebumps, but it truly felt like junk food reading as a kid. Oh. Whereas reading something okay. like Ella Enchanted is more meaningful. That's like a good. You that's a good to learn comparison. more yeah. about it. And you know, sometimes like you know, it's it's fluff reading, which can be right. Very there's fun. nothing wrong with there's there's nothing wrong with wanting a Twinkie every once in a while, like you know. Exactly. <laughs> it's just it's just you're not going to remember it very well. Thirty minutes later, for the food analogy. Um. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the thing because like I read Ella Enchanted once once as a kid and i remembered i really enjoyed it and it was fun to go back and reread it just because of how much i had forgotten because it i knew yeah. the like the bear that like the structure the base of the story and then there was so many things that i had forgotten about and reading it again was kind of like reading it for the first time a little more too especially coming to like 15 years or even more after that from when i first read it and just the stuff i picked up on it reading it as an adult versus reading it as a kid at the time too and like how i saw so many things differently and i saw a lot of characters differently and like i hated lucinda then and i hate her even more now yeah i think that's like one of the biggest signs of a good book honestly is that like it sticks in your mind even if you don't remember the details like you know they're going back i've read harry potter series like four times over Mm -hmm. I always find something new I remember. And then like when I finally reread the uh, speaker for the speaker for the dead from the Ender's Game series after not having read it for like 10 years, and I remembered why it's my favorite book even though I didn't remember why. Yeah. Like, I feel like I remember the plot yeah. twist at the end and that's about or like not really plot twist, but It is a What are the spoilers? <laughs> the M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> moment. <laughs> it, it, but they drop hints oh. because there wasn't they didn't plant a tree in him. And that's a clue. I make no sense. No, I, I, well, yes, it makes sense if you yeah. got the book. Anyway, Ella <laughs> Enchanted. I, I feel like that's gotta be the same thing with this book. It's like, I'm gonna go back and remember, like, there's so many, and, and I think we were talking about it earlier, but now more people are on the stream, like, all the little world-building details. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, like, the giants, like, love welcoming guests into their them. homes. And, like, um... Right, and there's, their wedding um, ceremony isn't, like pretty dress like formal clothes just talking to each other right. it's like they have their own pants miming out their life like yeah, yeah no and it's you know she didn't do just like one yeah. you know non-human society she did mm -hmm. three yeah i mean I, it's not as clear whether or not the the Arethi or aorthians Arethians are 
I'm pretty like, sure they're is, human. They're just like, they're like an another country, or like completely different race. Yeah, I think so. But like, yeah, yeah, the real emphasis on like culture. And yeah. Very, yeah. It's not I mean, the emphasis, I guess. It's just the details. But I like hearing about the elves and like their green teeth and like how they encountered her dad and they're like, eh, he's kind of yeah, eh, he's a meh I, human being. But then like their interaction with Ellen, they're like. Yeah, we like the, we like this one. And Not like, like Dad. Like, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> like what I a think, good like, compliment. You know, the of, like, they value people who like pay attention and like find beauty in small things. Like that was also a right. Good like point. even if he had been willing to like, you know, even if he wasn't being deceptive, like I honestly don't know if there would have been any amount of money or trade that her father could have offered that would have made them willing to give him one of the. Um, I don't remember the name, but you know, the like super special carvings. Yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. she's just like, like, this isn't a money value. This is a like worth value. Mm -hmm. I also loved the elves reading the, the story of uh, the shoemaker and the elves too. That was a great <laughs> kind of like, they were like, why are these elves so small? <laughs> They're so <laughs> tiny. <laughs> Oh but just like speckling stuff that like that in for extra character development or like just looking at elves in the book and yeah the world building was unparalleled honestly it is sure. and like i've kind of forgotten until like people had said they were buying like the trilogies and stuff i'm like oh right it's not really that they're like sequels but all of her books take place in the same universe i think mm -hmm. like i mean i know it said ferris is set in eorthea um, I don't know. I mean, Balmer was not mentioned in this book for certain. Um, I think there's, there's, there's a preview for a different one in the back of mine. That's the lost kingdom of Balmer. So yeah, in the, ba in the back of mine, I've got like a whole gallery of her books. And I think I see mm -hmm. some that probably aren't like there's, there's one called like Dave at night. And I'm like, I well, okay. That, All her fairy tale ones are set in the same universe, I should say. <laughs> And she has a good chunk of them. You know what? Maybe Dave is, is going <laughs> to fill up next to <laughs> I guess in terms of the world building, too, I love that it was Ella's linguistic gift that brought a lot of that together. And that's kind of what helped her a lot. And yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. And just seeing the connections that she made and like how, because of her linguistics, she was able to make deep, meaningful human connections with a lot of people. From different species. Non-human connections, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except the centaurs, who are dead inside. That was, yeah. I, just, I, just, I, just, me. I, I like, kept imagining, like, I don't Her know, petting a human head? Like, her <laughs> petting a human head that's just sort of like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so, it, it's so bizarre. <laughs> I can't. I cannot imagine. I'm that. going to guess those weren't in the movie. <laughs> no, the centaurs are people in the movie. Are like actual like a sentient race. And I'm trying to remember the races in the movie. So the giants are definitely in the movie, except the giants are not welcoming. They took that part out for some reason. Ah, I mean, um, the ogres must be in the character movie. character assassination. Ogres are there, yes, and elves. I want to say the elves maybe show up, but they're not plant. -based. Again, this was like five years ago I watched this, so right. I might be wrong. But there's definitely giants because she sings uh, Somebody to Love by Queen to the giants. What? At a party. Oh, I mean, it was Dan no. Hathaway singing Queen, which is like, kind of, it's fun to watch, but it's just like, this why? Isn't yeah, you're just like, why? <laughs> So I think it was because they like ordered her to like entertain them or something. Oh, something dumb like that. <laughs> Yeah. Does, does she have it would have been funner if she had a bad singing voice <laughs> you know i could i you know i definitely remember a lot of details about the movie the the, the ending is very unsatisfying they have a whole uh. thing about like there's like a guy who's trying to take over the king and he like finds out about ella's gift and like orders her to like kill him or whatever um to kill char i mean so it's mm -hmm. like that, and i don't even remember what actually breaks the curse and also lucinda doesn't learn her lesson in the movie which huh? is just she stays she stays bad <laughs> she never there, gets her comeuppance there's a lot of, there's a lot of very strange decisions i mean not strange because they kind of make for a more digestible like you know arc i think but <sighs> when will movie adaptations learn 
That oh, means I'm sure. Uh... Just let Peter Jackson produce every because. Okay, I would say except for Hobbit, except I heard that like he wasn't the original producer of Hobbit, like someone else started and he had to come in, so we don't blame Hobbit on him. But Hobbit, Lord I of the Rings no was idea. very good. I, <laughs> Hobbit, I just want to say I did not know that they had split the book into three movies until I was in the movie theater. I'm like, this is going to be a really, really long movie. I'm like, they're only here. Like, and why I was like... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Wait, I'm like, are they just gonna like? Is it gonna be like big writing that slowly like gets small and like slim? But no, then I realized I was like, oh, there's three. Uh, the Percy Jackson movie, Iliad Dome, that like kills thirteen year old me. That movie came out and I watched it and I died inside. When uh, I, was I, I had, was yeah, coming, no. Percy Jackson was coming out as I was growing up, so that was a big thing. Yeah, I th Aragon was the, I didn't see it, but I think that was the, the biggest book adaptation tragedy of, like, yep. that age time for me. Yeah. I don't know if any of y'all have read it, but are any of you guys excited for the Chaos Walking movie? I have not read it, no. It, it's a trilogy, and they're making it a movie with Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley. Hmm. Um it's the con I, I, I don't expect them oh, to wait, do anything. I might good have seen that. It. It's a very interesting book. Like it's it's kind of science fiction y. It's like yeah, it's science fiction y so they're like on some new planet that was colonized, but it turns out there's like a virus there that kills all women and makes men and make for the men, like their thoughts are basically audible to everybody else. Huh. Which is a very interesting concept. It's very like it, weird fiction. I told you that's like my jam. Um, but then he like finds a girl, and she and he can't hear her thoughts. And like she's like he's like, well, what's going on? Um, so Daisy Ridley is gonna play this old girl <laughs> in this movie. Um, it's a very interesting series. It's good, but the movie's gonna butcher it. I, I would say I'm sure. I'm sure Holland and Ridley will do their. They're good actors. They'll do they'll their do best, their but they'll they will be wasted. <laughs> well, because the movie. Because I'm pretty sure, like in the movie chair, it's like he happens upon like Daisy. He's like, "Whoa, a girl! I've never seen one before." And I'm like, "Okay, just that one line makes me think like this is going to be like." No oh, boy. That's Nick Jonas too. Oh my goodness. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I keep derailing. Good, good adaptations are out there. They're just not very common. <laughs> my 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 copy also has like I mean it has other bonuses in the back besides like the extra chapter. First of all, it has a glossary, which I don't think the what? version oh. I read originally had a glossary of the like. I mean, for the most part, like within the text, you do get a like either direct translation oh, or pretty darn too. close of most of the things that they say. Um. But like, oh, you know, like the, the, the little, the giant child that's lost, like, okay, I know what he literally said was, I want to go home. Like, you know, it's oh. something along those lines. It could have been like, I want my mommy. Where am I? But why, would they, why would they put a gloss? Like, I would never think to look for a glossary in a there fiction is? book. Yeah. I don't like, know, but there it is. <laughs> huh. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, I've seen a lot of fantasy books do that like have like glossaries for like language stuff and i think it like adds interesting world building for people who want it but i think most people just kind of skip over it i mean i feel I mean, like I... most of the time when i books i read that have glossaries are like there are you know terms that they've come up with that don't necessarily have equivalents and it's just like a refresher for like mm -hmm. i don't remember what this means <laughs> i'm not gonna read a glossary I will read footnotes. If you put footnotes, they're yeah. there. They're on the same page. I don't, oh, I don't have to dig House around for leaves. them. <laughs> yeah. House of Leaves is half footnotes. Oh, boy. <laughs> Those are Malcolm Gladwell books, though, too. Well, uh, well, it's because in House of Leaves, it's like there's basically a two narrators layered on top of each other. Oh, and so you have one narrator in the footnotes, and what? it's bizarre. It's I told you, I love this. That's book. like me. It, that would be the equivalent of like me and overthinking versus me, like the what they actually mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen footnotes used pretty, pretty well. In books. Yeah. Um, I like, I like, you know, I like the glossary. I, I like pronunciation things. I that is what much, I need more usually. <laughs> I very much get into the idea. It, House of Leaves is a great book. You guys should read that. Um, uh, also, sometimes they write the text upside down, but that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and there's 
What was I gonna say? Yeah, no, pronunciation rules, like, really help me. Like, it, it really helps me feel like I'm getting more into the world. Like, you know, I'm learning how to say the words and things like that. They did that in Speaker for the Dead because a lot of the names are Portuguese-based. And so they give you, like, a pronunciation rules guide for Portuguese. So you know, like, you know, this woman's name, which has an N-H-A in it, like, that's pronounced like Nya. Like, and not like Nha or whatever. So I like things like that. There's also... <laughs> Uh, uh, like bits of trivia in the back and Aww. the author accidentally named so I think this might have been her first work or at least her first like fairy tale work and then so the queen in this book is Queen Daria and then in Two Princesses of Balmer like the main characters are princesses obviously and their mother is already <laughs> dead but her name is Daria, and she forgot she reused the name until, like, she was at a signing, and someone asked her about it, and she went, I did what? Uh, <laughs> so now she so now she intentionally, like, if it's a minor character queen, she, like, intentionally always names them Daria. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, but if you want an example of the things that House of, House of Leaves does... Uh, I, I've uh, seen an XKCD that is based on House of this, Leaves. At, at, you can look at these pages going on. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I assume I assume that well, I shouldn't assume. There's not an audio book version of House of Leaves, no. is there? Because you just I couldn't. Think you, I think you could, because it's supposed to convey, like, use the medium of the text to convey like a sort of descent into chaotic madness by the narrator. Which I think works pretty well. Um anyway. I, I will gush about that book all <laughs> Um, um, all right, do you guys, in, including in the chat, is, do you guys have any other last thoughts about Ella Enchanted and why it's wonderful? About Miss Ella Frell. Who would you rather punch in the face, uh, and why is it Lucinda out of Lucinda and Hattie? Lucinda and Hattie, obviously. <laughs> I don't see, but I think, like, if you punched pre- like resolution Luc Lucinda, I don't think she would care. Like, I don't think it would do anything. Like, she'd just be like, ah ha ha ha. I guess like, yeah, she tried to have her redemption arc where she's like, oh, I'll do small magic at any time to help you out, Ella. And then like, still, it wasn't really that helpful. Like, I mean, it was kind of helpful, but like, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the smugness of Lucinda, but Hattie's smug too. Oh. I guess I, we could just Hattie, we could just steal Hattie's new wig, like <laughs> the wig snatch, the wig snatch. The fact that that, she snatches Hattie's weave. <laughs> that was yeah, probably my favorite. It's just like I couldn't burn it because the smell it's would like, wake up everyone. Couldn't burn it, the smell would break her. If I threw it outside, she might be able to retrieve it. I'm just it gonna was, steal it. <laughs> it was my favorite petty moment of the book. I'm like, yes, this this is the pettiness I'm here for. Absolutely. <laughs> And poor Olive doesn't get one because Olive is just there. I, there like, were, there Olive is a weird level of like, you feel sorry for her, but also she is like a brat. Like, right. there, but there is more balance to her definitely than there is with mm -hmm. Hattie. Yeah, that one letter where she's like, "I wish people listened to me," or like you know stuff like that. Also, when like, she's like, "I wish Ella took me with her when she ran away," like yeah, and I was oh. like, kind of like aww. <laughs> except, yeah. <laughs> You just want to take all her money, apparently. <laughs> yeah, honest to God. I'm How like, much money do I have? I'm like, bro, she's your servant. She's got nothing. And she's like, like give me your 50 cents. <laughs> I, I, I give got, me your lunch money, I gotta catch up. <laughs> oh, when Hattie, when Hattie makes it so Ella can't eat for, like, three days? Like, that was that bad. was awful. And then at the finishing school, the first thing the mistress, the headmistress is like, oh, so you're getting no dinner. Cool, you're getting no breakfast tomorrow, too. And then I guess, yeah, that's the first kindness is Ariane was like, yeah, I, that, I brought that's you this not role. right. Oh, that's a good point, Ilya. Like, in a lot of Cinderella retellings, one sister is dumb and one's, like, actually kind of evil. Right, the like, the stepmother sister. is always, like, actually evil, and the... That is true. It, Ilya, they're... Ilya, okay. The one isn't even dumb in Cinder in the Lunar Chronicles. The one stepsister is actually a complete sweetheart. Oh. Cinderella story. Love that movie. 
Love a good Hillary <gasps> Duff movie. A long time. I, don't know if I actually that. saw. I don't think I ever actually saw the Hillary Duff it's, one. That one's really good. That's a really good Cinderella adaptation. Yeah. Same with Enchanted. If you guys haven't seen that one, I love Enchanted. <laughs> Cinderella story has like one of my favorite fairy godmothers. Ooh, nice. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to. Have I seen the? I'm trying to remember if I saw the. Uh, is it Brandy or? Brandy, right? The where Whoopi Goldberg was the fairy godmother. Oh, I know what you're talking about, but like, I'm trying. To, okay, know. yes, Brandy. I'm trying to remember if I actually saw it or not, or if I just like saw enough clips of it at some. You know how it is on the internet afterwards. You've seen like so many images from something, you like trick yourself into thinking you saw it. <laughs> Roger and Harrison. <laughs> yes. They just keep remaking with different... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for good Cinderella adaptations. Yay. All right. Um, do we want to do our picture book story time? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, the, so I actually picked this out, like, I had this in mind for a few weeks. So this isn't, like, I didn't pick this out just because of recent stuff. Um, but this is about a... Um, Japanese American girl and her grandfather. It's very sweet. Um, and just a reminder that we are <laughs> make someone put make Monica put on a hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, we are fundraising for Stop AAPI Hate, so Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. And uh, ten dollars, I will start stacking hats. I got a bunch around me. There's some good ones. Okay, I am going to make Monica. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to overlap you a little bit mayor sorry i have not uh, figured out an alternate scene for uh <laughs> for uh for story Let's times see. but uh, all right no, i moved the wrong way there you go, there you go. I okay before. so yes it is ten dollars per hat mm -hmm. so this is oji chan's gift by is that an e thierry Ugak. Ugaki. All right. When Mayumi Van Horten was born, her grandfather built her a garden. It sat behind a tiny brown house, neatly halfway around the nearly halfway around the world, and was like unlike any other garden she knew. There were no tulips or daffodils or daisies, no carrots or cabbages or peas. Oji-chan had made the garden out of stones, big ones, little ones, and ones in between. Some reminded Mayumi of turtles. Others stood like mountains, rugged and tall. Around the border, Oji-chan had planted pine and maple, boxwood and bamboo. And in just the right spot, by a stone lantern and a persimmon tree, was a sheltered bench where Oji-chan and Mayumi would share onigiri bento Packed in a lacquered box. Every summer, Mayumi spent two months with Oji-chan, and with each year, her ability to care for the garden grew. She learned that moss on a rock was a gift of time, not to be washed away with a hose. That weeding was more pleasant in the morning. And that clipping shrubs to look like clouds was the best reason of all to prune. This is Ojitan's gift. Sorry, I did that a little quickly. Raking gravel, though, was what Mayumi enjoyed most. She loved how the tiny rocks chattered as they passed through the rake's wooden teeth. She loved the different patterns she could make, wavy, zigzag, and straight. But rings, like ripples in a pond, were her favorite. And when she was done, Mayumi and Oji-chan would sit and enjoy the results of her efforts in happy silence. Often, when Mayumi was back home in her narrow house, listening to the clamor of traffic outside, she would wish for the sounds she heard at Oji-chan's, the rustle of leaves, or the creak of a bough, or a twittering bird. At those times, Mayumi would open up the tin that held souvenirs from her visit, leaves she'd pressed in a book until they dried, as delicate as dragonfly wings, 
Tiny pine cones, still springy between her fingertips. A smooth black stone that, when warmed in her hand, helped her to remember. Then, one summer, everything changed. Uh, uh, everything Monica. changed, and a hipster, you could get 10 hats coming coming right up. Oh, I have gosh. Aw, <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you, hipster. <laughs> I was waiting for the page break. <laughs> <laughs> everything changed on screen as Monica became just hats. Mayumi noticed the differences as soon as she arrived. Things in the house that used to shine were dusty and dull. In the garden, shrubs and trees were overgrown, and dead leaves and needles littered the ground. Everything looked left alone. She understood now that what her parents had told her was true. Oji-chan could not live here anymore. Later in Oji-chan's room, Mayumi tried to smile while she showed him photos from the school year. Birdsong wafted in on a green-scented breeze. Mayumi looked out at her garden. Hi, Oji-chan said. It's been waiting for you, Mayumi-chan. After lunch, while Oji-chan napped, Mayumi went into the garden and walked out onto the gravel. As she stared at the rock that towered over every other rock around it, the tight bud of feeling that had been in her chest all morning suddenly burst open, and with a rush, she put her hands on the rock, braced her feet in the drift beneath, and gave a mighty shove. When nothing happened, Mayumi turned around and leaned back, knees bent. She pushed as hard as she could, wanting the rock to give, and if it did, she was going to push and push and push until the thing toppled down. But the rock didn't budge, not even a little. Mayumi kicked the ground hard, spraying gravel everywhere. She ticked again and again, not caring, until a rock ricocheted back and hit her on the face. She froze, and as she noticed the mess she'd made, she put a hand to her cheek and sagged to the ground. The next morning, while her parents packed up the house, Mayumi, or wait, sorry, I missed a page. After a while, Mayumi stood up and began raking because it was something useful that she could do. And as she slowly raked the gravel back in place, stopping, stooping now and then to pick up a stray leaf or to pocket a shiny pebble, a tiny idea took root. The next morning, while her parents packed up the house, Mayumi knocked on Oji-chan's door. Ah, Mayumi-chan, he said. Is it lunch already? Mayumi walked to where he sat and held out the lacquered bento box. This feels heavier than onigiri, Oji-chan said as he took it from her. He grinned. What are you feeding me? Maybe mud pie? Mayumi smiled and shook her head. Oji-chan set the box on his lap and... After a moment, he lifted the lid. Now I've made you a garden, Mayumi said. Ojitan took her hand and gripped it tight. Arigato, Mayumi-chan, he said. Hanzo ni arigato. Thank you very much. Any Hanzo mains in chat? I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> I just heard Hanzo and I got excited. <laughs> Hanzo! <laughs> but look, it's a little bento box garden. I love it. Your, your girl stands a bento box. Your girl <laughs> also stands a zen garden. Back home, Mayumi unpacked her suitcase and set aside several small bags. Then she took out her tin and emptied it of her treasures. The sandy gravel went in first, followed by stones of various sizes, placed just so. She added a pine cone next, and then a leaf, before patting the gravel flat. Then, using her pinky as a rake, 
Mayumi carefully made smooth, e smooth, even rings around the three largest rocks. And even though the garden was much smaller and the sound was much softer, if she closed her eyes and listened, she was certain she could still hear the pebbles soothing chatter. The end. So yeah, I like that one. It's just like sweet grandma, grandfather, granddaughter time and sweet. stuff. Also, stuff changes sometimes and doesn't. I've, I've, I've acquired a friend. Where is your, where is your friend? There's a boy. Aww. He started scratching at me. Hi. Hi, Charles. Aww. Hi, buddy. Hi, Charles. Man, I said... <laughs> The cat would come back from earlier, but the cat was here before stream. Yeah, <laughs> Monica and Maeve made, saw her. <laughs> my housemate's dog, but my but he um I think my housemate's been out all day, so no, he, he needs he needs he got lonely and started scratching at my door. <laughs> I also <laughs> thought I also thought the friends was gonna be the cheese and fox. <laughs> <laughs> the cheese and fox is a very good friend. <laughs> good good cheese. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Book related before we, we wrap up for the night. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I need to get back into reading more books. Yeah, not, not just book club. I, I started was... at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic. I started like really getting into reading and read like four books over the summer, but then I kind of dropped off. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, if anyone needs book recommendations, you know, pop yeah. pop what you're looking uh, for into the chat in the discord and yeah. I need your mags or other the, people will get to it. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna have to get into the Lunar Chronicles. I've heard so many people it's today so have been saying it's good. So yeah. that'll be the next one I'll have to get. Yes, there are, okay. So, so there's- on Goodreads group? There's four core books. There's like a fifth book that's like sort of a prequel and it was published between the third and the fourth book. And I think that's like where I read it in order. It probably would I would it, nod, but... but I'm scared that this stuff will fall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Zelda thought Thank you so much. I keep looking back because I think Charles is going to want me to take him out. I mean, I can <laughs> try. To be... <laughs> All my, everything on my Goodreads account is picture books. I just use it for work, but. The boy. Aww. Hey, buddy. I'm a boy and ignore my terrible, <gasps> terrible room. Yes, I. It's been a bit. It's been a hot minute, but I did read Princess Academy once upon a time. Shannon Hale does a lot of good, like feminist themes I in her reading. Princess Academy. I remember those ones. That's true. Like it might have one. people's real names. That's so. true. Hip star. We may, maybe instead we can do like a Google sheet or something that we can pin in the. In the Discord channel, and then yeah, only <laughs> I just need someone who doesn't have their real name attached to their email. Oh wait, no, that's right. I made a Captain Trina at Gmail at some point. Oh, I'll use nice. that. <laughs> that doesn't have my name yeah. on it. <laughs> hey, we have Kinstone emails. Our we real do. names attached to those. We do, but oh, they need the, oh, the space think... on that for business stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I don't think I don't have a Kinstone email. Sad. And I think my the email I used for like yeah I have still have Maeve McLass name Aww. on all my things. I say Mick last name because I can, it's a Mick name. But. <laughs> but yeah, no, we can try to get something a little more like form, not formal, but like organized setup for yeah. stuff, books, books people recommend. That'd be fun. All right. I'll do that. For sure. Um, okay. So next month on April 17th, that's a Saturday. Yes. Yes. April 17th will be our next meeting and we will be reading ghost by jason reynolds which is not a supernatural thing at all it's 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 a, actually um it's actually about track it's it's about mm -hmm. um it's about a black track team and it's it's oh. it's a nice short read it's like only 181 pages but okay. jason reynolds is a a very good author so yeah if you're looking if you'll know you have the right book if the book cover is yellow with just like a single kid like about running out of frame mm. so Find that, read it, and we'll see you guys back here next week. Max should be back next month. Um, <laughs> she, she should hopefully have her computer set back up, but I will be here in any case, and we will have whoever, whoever we have here. Um, there was one more yeah. bonus hat that was the big brim boy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. 
Okay, uh, let me, do we have anyone we can raid? I don't know that I have a good raid. Oh, hey guys, hey guys, mm -hmm. Big John what? is streaming. Should oh, we raid Big John? Yeah. Let's yeah. raid Big John. Let's do it. All right, thanks for hanging out everyone. See you next month. Read some good Bye, stuff. Everyone. Give me the bonus hat as we're dipping out. <laughs> Your girl is a hat stacking champ. Queen of hat stacks. <laughs> See you later, everyone.